So here we are. Yeah. <laughs> We're here. Do you want to like just welcome everyone and do a little grounding before we get into? Sure. It? Yeah. Yeah. Sure. Well, thank you all for being punctual. Yeah. Yes, um, that feels. Um, what's the word? Um, anxiety producing. <laughs> <laughs> When people show up on time for something, it makes me think something's going on. <laughs> I didn't get the, the text about something that I was supposed to be on time for, but they must be serving food then. <laughs> no? Okay. Well. <laughs> um, well, welcome everyone. I just wanted to, before we begin, you know, just kind of, you know, our conversation, I just wanted just to welcome all of you here, but not just you, like definitely you. But I just want to welcome all your people and your communities mm. and your ancestors into the space. You know, even if you don't like your ancestors, they're still with you. So it might as well say, come on. <laughs> you know? Um, and just, I welcome your experiences, the totality mm. of who you are, you know, um, the totality of your aspirations of who you're trying to become. Because mm. we're all in process, mm. right? And just acknowledging the messiness of the process, which is the, the energy, I think, of this topic, the messiness, mm. right? You know, and I think that sometimes we come into conversations like this and it gets really, it's activating, mm. right? Because so many of us have been so hurt yeah. in different ways, you know, um, in the subject, in this, like, the villainy, mm. the the victim, you know, binary, you know? Um, mm -hmm. and some of us have really made homes in this binary. I think yeah. that it can feel really uncomfortable for that, that positionality to be challenged, mm. right? You know, so it's okay, you know? Mm. Like, I mean, <laughs> like we, we're, we, we've all been villains. We've all been the victim, right? Mm. Some of us do it at the same time, you know, all at once. But, mm -hmm. but this is a part of getting free. It's first telling the truth about this, naming this. Mm -hmm. There's no liberation without truth telling. Mm -hmm. There's no healing without the truth, mm -hmm. right? So I just welcome that, mm -hmm. you know, just to, to trust this space to hold you, you know, even if you don't know anyone mm -hmm. that's sitting around you. I want, I just, I invite you to take a risk. And to say, you know what, I don't know this person, but I'm going to trust that in this space that maybe they can show up mm -hmm. and hold me, right? Because we're going to be holding you as well. Mm -hmm. We're going to be holding each other mm -hmm. in this as well, you know? So remember the earth, right? Remember the seat under you. Feel that grounding, mm -hmm. you know? Feel that holding right? as, we, as we begin this work, mm -hmm. this dialogue. And just, again, deep gratitude to Prem and to the organizers to this beautiful bookstore, which I'm going to be so distracted <laughs> at these books, you know. Um, but I'm going to hold on. I'm going to, like, really focus, you know. Um, and, uh, and, uh, and deep gratitude to our friend, Nova Reed, mm -hmm. you know, who's responsible for getting us here. <laughs> as soon as we got here. Because <laughs> we would still be coming. <laughs> If it wasn't for Nova, you know, and but we thank you for your incredible work mm -hmm. in this community as well, mm -hmm. the labor that you do as well. Mm -hmm. you know. All right. Yeah. Yeah, and and deep gratitude for you, Lord. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, I, <laughs> I forgot to offer you gratitude. No. No, you, can't, you can't outdo me. No. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like the the kind of invitation for us all to come with with the fullness of ourselves, that, that permission for our messiness, is actually quite a rare invitation. Um, and I'm so grateful for your work because that is what I often feel like I'm encountering again and yeah. again. That invitation for me to inhabit the fullness of my humanity, yeah. both in your company, but also in kind of communion with your work. Yeah. Um, and this, I think, this invitation that we're gonna be kind of stepping into today, is examining, like Rod said, the messy place. And we're living, I think, particularly in this time through dynamics of extreme polarization. You know, we're seeing on a global scale how much harm can happen when um, there's a co-opting, I think, of, of both victimhood and villainy. But 
I think sometimes when we talk about these dynamics, we're, we're talking about them as if they're happening out there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and as, as if it's not, as if we're not complicit in these systems of domination, as if these dynamics aren't at play in the most intimate spheres of our own lives. Mm -hmm. And so what we really, our intention, our prayer for today mm -hmm is to move through starting off looking at the ways it's playing out at a global level, yeah. but also the ways that it shows up in our relationships, in the places we, we love, in the ways that it gets really, really close to us, right? Um, I think there's something about the, the move to victimhood and villainy that is in itself, no matter which position, a dehumanization, mm -hmm. right? We, we kind of make these, these kind of cardboard cutouts of our, from our mind and fix people in these very shallow ways yeah. that misses the rich complexity mm -hmm. and messiness beyond these identities, mm -hmm. right? Um, and I think, you know, in your work, Rod, you're often inviting us to come towards the greyer place yeah. and, and recognising too that underneath any, any behaviour of harm yeah. is often hurt. Yeah and is, is often a sense of woundedness. Yeah. Now, if we look at this current political moment, yeah. we're seeing white victimhood co-opted mm -hmm. at a large scale to um, villainize Palestinians, mm -hmm. not just Palestinians, mm -hmm. any all allyship with Palestinians, mm -hmm. um, and under that kind of guise of villainy, all kinds of uh, <coughs> violence has become justified, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. Quite literally mass murder, but if we think right. about these different um, arms of the state, yeah. like the university system, mm -hmm. that also becomes a means to police and punish yeah. uh, through this kind of painting of villainy. Mm -hmm. And so, I, I, we're not going to start light, yeah. let's get into it. <laughs> but basically, yeah. what I, I, yeah. I want to invite us to really think about is how can we return, how can, well, what is actually, yeah. what is the task of love mm -hmm. in this moment mm -hmm. when we're meeting so much unlove, so much cruelty? Yeah. What does it mean to really practice and embody love in this moment? Yeah. But I, I think in a real way, it's always been kind of cruel, mm. you know? Mm -hmm. Like, it's, I think there have been moments in history and conflicts that have, like, accentuated that cruelty. Mm -hmm. But, like, many of us have been surviving cruelty for a long mm -hmm. time because most of us have been surviving unconditional love. I mean, rather, I'm sorry, conditional love. Mm. Like, that conditionality that, like, I have to be a certain way to be safe to be cared for, to get the resources that I need, mm -hmm. right? And we just kind of normalize that, mm -hmm. right? And then, but it gets sparked and triggered when we begin to feel how that conditional loving actually really easily kind of slips into this really visceral violence. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, conditional love is violence, right? To begin with, it can be mental violence, it can even be physical violence, but like in moments like this, mm. we really begin to see the limitation of, con of conditional love, mm. right? You begin to see people get to that edge and all of a sudden they lose it, mm. you know? And then I think that we slip into the otherness mm. that you were really like pointing out. It's like yeah. the villainy, like mm. otherness is just villainy, Mm. You know, it's the ways in which we're, like, trying to bypass our own complexities mm. in which we're complicit in harm and say, no, that's happening over there. Yeah. Mm. You know, yeah. that's happening with the brown people over there. Yeah. You know, and whatever happens to them, they deserve it. Mm. Mm. Right? That's conditional love. Mm. <laughs> it's like, you're not good enough to be safe. Mm. So whatever you get, you deserve. Mm. Right? And that's the weaponizing, mm. right, of conditional love, right? Mm -mm. And so when we bring love into the conversation. It's mm. like, for most of us, this is a brand new conversation. Like, I mean, how many of us have actually just sat around and talked about love? Mm. You know, not, not just reading Bell Hooks' book. <laughs> <You know? laughs> not just listening to, like, all of our favorite R&B songs about love, which aren't about love. You know, it's just really about, like, suffering. <laughs> I mean, sex, if it's good, like... <laughs> Like, if it's great, but, like, mm. you know, that longing, that mm. attachment, which mm. isn't love, mm. right? It's fixation. Mm. But, like, when do we sit and talk about the politics of love yeah. on one level, but also the real, the, the interpersonal experience mm. of love, which is, I think, crusted in a lot of trauma. Mm -hmm. You know, at least it was for me when I started having these conversations. It's like, I didn't want to 
do that. Mm -mm. You know, because all of my experiences of love, well, most of my experiences of love were very conditional, Hmm. right? And I had to work hard to understand that I did indeed experience unconditional love, but it was (coughs) so overshadowed Mm. by the Mm. violence of conditional Mm. loving, right? And so we find ourselves in this moment, right, where we have so many people who swear that they're like Christians, you know, mm. or like Buddhists, you know, I'm just talking about my experiences, right, or whatever, mm. and they swear they're like, oh, like, I'm about love, you know, but that love is actually just a weaponizing mm. of their own deep insecurities mm. around villainy and otherness, mm-hmm. you know, mm. so it feels like we have to go back to the beginning now mm. and say, okay, let's talk about love, mm. like for real. And how do we actually begin to experience that love and transform it into a politic Mm. that actually begins to shift culture Mm. and community towards centering care and safety Mm. and and resourcefulness for everyone, not just Mm. the people we like or, you know, or the people we think are good enough, but everyone deserves to be safe and cared for and resourced. Therefore, everyone deserves to be loved. Mm. Right. And I hear this, yeah. and I absolutely am like, I'm here for it. And I think when it comes to the embodiment of it, yeah. when we are facing so much cruelty, so for example, what is it then to the task of loving um, someone who is outright like professing Zionism mm-hmm. um, and is is engaged in in real violence? Mm-hmm. Is it my task in terms of being someone who is really seeking to embody an ethic of love, yeah. to love the oppressor? Mm-hmm. And, and I think there's something about this because I think um, mm-hmm. in, in my heart of hearts, I, I want to believe that love is not a limited resource, right. that it is abundant and available. Yeah. And if I am giving it yeah. to the Zionist, yeah. doesn't mean that that's at the expense of Palestinians, right? Right. But in reality, yeah. I think in the practice, you know, we are, our resources do sometimes feel quite limited. We are extremely mm-hmm. exhausted by what we're having to live through. We are all living through a genocide in different ways. Right. And therefore, there is a question I have, I think, about um, how we can love whilst being attuned to our resource, yeah. our capacity, but also whilst needing to honour the rage that is also yeah. a central part of this yeah. process. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, what, what do you think there is how do we kind of hold the balance of yeah. that practice of both being yeah. attuned to yeah. the rage yeah. that is calling for our attention yeah. whilst also mm-hmm. stepping into relationship in, in really loving ways? Yeah. A radical compassion, I think, yeah. is also part of this. Right, yeah. Yeah, you know, but here's the thing, you know, that I talk about, and you know I talk mm-hmm. about this, is that there's a difference between life and love. Mm-hmm. You know, I love it when that just dropped in the middle of this point. I was trying to, I had this take. I was, like, and y'all know better in the back. <laughs> Every time I'm dropping a point, I'm like, I'm gonna get you with this one. No, but no, like no, this whole thing about like the difference between like and love, it's too conflated for us, mm-hmm. right? I don't have to like you to love you. Mm. Right? I may not be helping you, <laughs> you know, mm. get shit that you need, right? But it doesn't mean that I'm trying to get in the way, mm-hmm. right? So when we talk about, okay, how, how are we in relationship to people who maybe want us dead, mm. right? Or who are expressing ideas that, that, that create harm, mm-hmm. right, for other communities, right? So in that moment, I'm like, my work isn't to like you. Mm-hmm. I may be very well telling you to go to hell in my head. You know, and I may be keeping myself from pushing you off that ledge into hell, (laughs) you know, but you have to name that, right? Mm -hmm. But in that moment, at the same time, I'm like, but you also deserve access to the resources you need Mm -hmm. to be well, because it feels like you're saying this and doing this because you don't have full access to what you need. Mm -hmm. Knowledge, information (laughs) is a resource that I think people Mm. you know need as well healing is a resource people need if people got that how would they be different Mm -hmm. right and so in that space my anger is held Mm. right because it's like the love is also holding Mm. the anger yeah but you have to the critical piece here is the love for self Mm -hmm. i love myself enough 
And I trust myself through that love enough to show up and Mm. to say, you know what? I'm not trying to hurt you as much as you're trying to hurt me right now. But I will protect myself. (laughs) Right? You know, I don't want you to suffer in the ways that I've suffered or suffer in the ways that other people are suffering right Mm. now. That takes a lot of work to get into. That takes getting into our own woundedness. Yes. Right? And that's something that community can't do on our behalf. Right? Like, no one can jump into my experience and heal me. Mm-hmm. Right? You know, this is, this is where we have to get kind of individual. Mm-hmm. You know? Mm-hmm. Individualism in relationship to collective. Right. But, like, I have, to, I have to be with myself in order to get to my own woundedness. Because mm-hmm, mm-hmm. if I don't hold that in enough care, then I won't able, be able to have the space to hold other people. Mm-hmm. Right? Mm-hmm. You know? Nor will I feel protected yeah. enough to be in conversation and relationship with people who want me dead. Mm-hmm. You know? And, mm-hmm. Yeah, and I, I hear that. Like, I, do think, I do think there's something about how a lot of this work of tending to our woundedness yeah. and the deep grief that sits underneath behaviours often that harm. Yeah. Often there is unattended hurt. Yeah. Does, it is, there is um, something about sitting in the individual way, yeah. but our capacity to do that, I think, is deepened through relational experiences. Sure. We need to know that we are loved. We need to know that we aren't going to be shunned or exiled or exposed in some kind of way as the fixed villain. Do you see what I mean? Coming back to this binary thing. Yeah. I, and I think there's something about uh, the relationality that is foundational yeah. to the work of tending to the wound individually. Yeah. We need each other. Yeah. So we also need to reflect back to each other that we are lovable enough to do yeah. this work. Yeah. Um, and that we won't be, yeah, we won't be disposed of. Yeah. But can you speak more about the the way that we have to take risks yes to do work yeah and part of that risk is not it well is the potential of not getting what we need yeah from yeah. others around us yeah so i think this is something that a lot of people are bringing into the space mm. it's like sometimes we have to make choices that actually goes against mm-hmm. what other people are doing because it doesn't matter like you know I think sometimes we frame community in a positive, mm-hmm. and it's not always. No, definitely. I mean, can you see? <laughs> yeah, of course. <laughs> <But> the- <laughs> you know, this is, this is the drama piece, yeah, right? Yeah, you know, yeah. like, yeah. it's like we're, some of us are exhausted in community because mm-hmm. it's nothing but drama. Yeah. You know? But I, think, I think there's also something about what, what community manifests sure. is the conditions that we're in. You know, we are all breathing embodiments of the state and the lies of hierarchy that we live in, mm-hmm. you know? This oppressive, this oppressive society finds its way into our bodies. So of course, yeah. we end up meeting hierarchical logics in relationship. Yeah. We end up meeting carcerality. You know, we punish each other essentially because the prison logics are so deeply embedded into our society mm-hmm. and to mm-hmm. our discourse where we mm-hmm. see the world as bad or good or mm-hmm. that is punishable or rewardable behavior. Mm-hmm. And, and so we've all kind of become more reductive in the ways that we see the world mm-hmm. and, and split into a binary yeah. uh, kind of perspective of the world. Yeah. And I think there's something as well about how binaries serve to defend against the not knowing, mm-hmm. the kind of mystery and awe mm-hmm. that comes beyond the, right. the kind of reductive bad or good. Yeah. Um, and, and I think, you know, you were talking about what is the work of risk yeah. In mm-hmm. relationship, mm-hmm. well, we have to leap into the unknown with the other. Mm-hmm. And we, we also, I think, we're taking that risk of revelation of all of these parts of ourselves mm-hmm. that I think society invites us to hide away. Mm-hmm. Because in that place of revelation, there's often such a quick risk of punishment, yeah. you know, of, of kind of that being pushed or shunned again. Yeah. And so when we turn towards each other, we're, 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 the task is, can I meet you in all of this messiness? Can, mm. I, can I really hold it even when you become a reflection of the unsightly parts in myself? Mm-hmm. And I think this is also the work of self-examination that right. you're inviting us to think about, which yeah. is the, the extent to which I can look at the unsightly parts in you, the villainy, the victimhood, all of the mess in between, 
is also the extent to which I can do that in my, myself. You know, can I see the ways in which I am making a villain of myself or I feel a sense mm. of deficiency or inadequacy or mm. I go to punish myself for the yeah. ways that I am showing up in the world mm -hmm. and, and to tend to that with a much greater generosity mm -hmm. and compassion. And the more I can kind of cultivate that practice, mm. you know, I deepen my capacity to extend that to the other. Um, and so there's, I think that mm -hmm. that's a deep part of this relational work. Mm -hmm. But so much of it, I think sometimes we get quite caught up in an in individual sense of safety. It's like, mm -hmm. uh, I need to go into this and feel safe, rather than thinking about how can we cultivate a collaborative, relational sense of you and I, yeah. both of us are taking risks. We will inevitably get hurt. There might be some injury. Yeah. How will we tend to that? There's more transparency and a radical honesty in that. Yeah. But both people, have to consent yes. to that discomfort. Right. But then what happens when people aren't consenting? Mm -hmm. Let's just say I am consenting, you don't consent, or vice versa, whatever. Like, I don't right. want to make you a villain. <laughs> 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 but whatever, yeah, yeah. like, one of us doesn't consent. Right. Then what do I do then? Or what mm. does the consenting person do? Right. Right? Because I think that's a position that many of us are in. Like, we yeah. want... Maybe mm. we like want to do the work, and mm. the person that you know we're in this difficult relationship does it. You know, mm. so what? Where do what do we do? Yeah, you know, where do we go? Yeah, and I, I think well, this is besides I mean, blocking. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah. Well, I think this. I think this is it, isn't it? That that's why um, it's become so pervasive. Yeah. Like a, a means to cope has been like blocking is such a practice tool now mm. Um, mm. in our culture. And I think part of that is also because we have, you know, so social media culture yeah. has made thinner versions of us, like these kind of holograms of each other. Um, and so it's, it's almost easier to have a storied idea of who that other person is. And, and much easier as well to just block and get rid of them mm -hmm. if that story no longer serves the way that I want to live or the story that I want to hold on yeah. to. Um, mm -hmm. and, and I think the move towards not shunning, not blocking, mm -hmm. is, you, you, I think you named this, mm -hmm. it, it's, it's heavily related to our capacity to bear discomfort. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, and, our, and, our wit, and I think, yes, there's something about the consent to a generative conflict, yeah. but I think there's also a, a piece around how can our community around us uh, kind of create scaffolding to make that more possible, mm -hmm. to invite us into recognizing mm -hmm. our own responsibility in mm -hmm. this work mm -hmm. and, and the duty of repair that we have yeah. to kind of be in more loving relationship with each other. Yeah. That's a lot of work for community. Yeah. Um, I mean, I, th I think there's a real situation for many of us where Maybe we haven't been so intentional about the communities mm. that we've created. They just kind of happen, you know? Um, and I've often been in this situation. Yeah. I just, like, all of a sudden, I'm in this community, you know, but we actually are not on the same page. We just like to, like, have fun and drop it like mm. it's hot, you know? <laughs> then it gets real. Yeah. And then you realize, oh, we actually don't have care among us. Yeah. And I think without the care, how do you actually work with people, collab with people in the community to say, mm. listen, how do we hold this conflict? Mm. Like, what do we do then? Mm. You know? Yeah. I mean, I mean, I guess particularly the question is, like, what do we do when our community does not have the capacity mm. to care for us and mm. to care for each other? Yeah. Right, mm. in terms of like holding conflict with mm. care, mm. like what happens? Yeah, and I, I you know, I've, um, I think this this particular topic is very close to my own, mm -hmm. my own heartbreak. Yeah. Um, you know, I I've had my own experiences of kind of being made villain, mm -hmm. um, and also had my own experiences of I think, uh, responding like not responding actually reacting to. Uh, making a villain or victimhood so almost kind of re repeating the cycle the cycle you know and and then and then kind of really 
delving into the courage of asking for help because that isn't a practice that's come easily for me. Mm-hmm. And then having to meet the gulfs of, like you said, yeah. of where people are and where they can meet you. Um, and I think also there's something about the kind of gulfs between, especially in organising spaces, mm-hmm. the kind of publicly professed politic mm-hmm. of freedom, that we, we are doing this work, we are out here, you know, and then when you come to actually say, can we live it together? You know, the, the real gulfs in between and the heartbreak yeah. in that. And I think that, you know, I think the sharper edges of that heartbreak, especially, uh, and, I, and maybe this rings true for, for queer folks, you know, in the room is we maybe come to uh, queer spaces, organising spaces, right. with a, a kind of pedestaled fantasy mm-hmm. of something else, a kind of queer utopia, queer landia, you know, in mm-hmm. some way. Because we've had such painful experiences, mm-hmm. often from family, from society, of exile, of rejection, um, where we've had to almost, in ways, exile parts of ourselves to find a sense of belonging, right? And then here we are, tasked to love reflections of ourselves, people that look like us, that um, society has told us again and again that is unlovable, that is bad, that is villainous. So of course there's a, a kind of a repetition of the hurt that we've had yeah. and it hurts so much more in yeah. a way because you've you kind of the, the dream is something else yeah. mm-hmm. and then and then you're kind of confronted with having to really feel that yeah. grief and so I think um, you know to, to name my own experience a lot of this work has been moving again and again from grievance to ah why aren't you doing this fucking thing like help me do it different you know to grief oh this is where we this is where we are yeah. you know and this is this is all you can give and yeah. i can still love you mm. in these spaces yeah. and no it's not an ideal you know there's yeah. a, there's the kind of the one that we talked we talked about this before you know the one that wants i want accountability and i want it fucking now and yeah. i want you know yeah. make this different and it just and it can't come like that yeah. and so there's there's you know a lot of this work for me has been grief but I think the other side of it is often the people who are also causing the harm and that's not to say that I haven't been participatory in hurting or causing harm but it's that underneath there is an uh, untended grief that gets this it gets acted out over and over again so so much of this work is how can we be with the disappointment Mm. as well how can we hold that yeah Yeah. I would you know and to to continue yeah right your beautiful sharing I think sometimes we build or create particularly queer community around the pain Mm. you know Um, and so that's all we know Mm. is the pain right and then when you try to do something different then and this has been my personal personal experience right Mm -hmm. when I have chosen the work of healing then I have been considered suspects Hmm. And then people say, oh, well, Rod, like, you're just bypassing no. the work. You're not really in this. Like, mm. because if you were really in the struggle, you would be in pain. You mm. would be pissed off. And I would say, but no, I'm tired of that. Mm-hmm. Like, at what point do we choose something different? Yeah. Right? Because I can't survive this communal identification with this density Hmm. right you know Hmm. like I I thought queer meant like fun (laughs) (laughs) right you know and then we we weigh each other down Mm -hmm. right and not only that like individuals are self-identifying with the pain so this is what I am Mm -hmm. right Mm -hmm. and in my work in in contemplative practice like that's the easiest way to trap yourself in these carceral Logics yeah. is to say, I am. Mm. You know, I am not in pain. Pain is an experience mm. that I'm having. That doesn't make me suspect. I'm mm. just telling the truth, mm. right? Because I need to believe that I'm something else mm. than this pain. That's my door to liberation. And mm. that's, that's my hope. That mm. keeps me hopeful. Mm -hmm. Right. When I say I believe that I can experience something else Mm -hmm. besides the pain. Mm -hmm. Right. And I think so much of this difficulty is how are we trying to build or create 
healing relationships with people who don't believe in healing Mm -hmm. or they believe that the pain is what it is Mm -hmm. right you know because it's I think you find yourself communicating to the pain not the person yeah you know yeah and the pain is like this wall Mm -hmm. right and then it can and it, it it's had a tendency in my life you know when I've had you know these interactions it, it's like it gets reflected back to me mm. right where mm. I become the one that's dangerous yeah. for people because I'm trying mm. to do something different mm. because I become invisible mm. when I make a different choice to heal yeah. I don't know who you are and I can't trust you yeah. so you have to leave mm. right and I have been asked to leave mm communities right where you know i've listen <laughs> you know i have walked into spaces intervention spaces unknowingly where people have been like rod we need to talk to you mm-hmm. you know and it was a talk that says it's time for you to go mm-hmm. you know because we don't know what the hell you're doing mm-hmm. you're not doing what we're doing which is trauma bonding <laughs> you know and then i'm like i thought we were supposed to be getting free mm-hmm. right then the other issue arises, right? Another big issue, which is when I say freedom and when you say freedom, I think we're talking about different things, yeah. mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. You know, and that has taken a lot of emotional energy mm-hmm. to hold. It's like, oh, I, I don't want to come off as judgmental right. and petty, mm-hmm. which I do anyway like I try not to articulate that but I'm mm-hmm. suddenly judging everyone in this room <laughs> right <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not you know um, but no but like it's just like you get into this hierarchy where you're like no my freedom yeah. is the real freedom and what you're doing mm-hmm. it's just like these perpetual cycles of suffering mm-hmm. right mm-hmm. and so I can't be a part of this so this is an elitism <laughs> that happens mm. right and how do we stay how do we not? How do we stay with people? Not necessarily physical, but how? How do I keep that hierarchy from mm. emerging mm. when I am comparing my liberation to other people's liberation? Mm-hmm. How do we keep that mm. from getting out of control? Mm. Because that becomes othering and villainy. Like you know, yeah. you're you're the villains now. Yeah. Right. And I, I think so often, and I, th- I think we have to enter this with compassion mm-hmm. because so often the move to step above mm-hmm. in relationship, the move towards domination, yeah. is when someone is feeling some sense of threat or fear. Yeah. You know, I, and, I, and I think about this when I'm trying to understand these dynamics of victimhood and villainy, mm-hmm. where a victimhood is co opted. And, and we talked about this, I think this is a manifestation of hierarchy. You know, that victimhood becomes the higher position of domination to kind of keep a sense of, a false sense of safety. Mm-hmm. But we know that, the, that, that any position in this hierarchy is precarious ground. Mm-hmm. And, and so there's some, I think there's something about also the willingness for us to be extremely vulnerable with each other. Mm-hmm. You know, to really step towards naming again and again, oh, these are the ways in which I'm, you know, my hurts show up. These are the ways in which you are hurting me. Can we can we tend to that together? Um, and I and I, I think underneath, you know, the more we we build a practice, we build a muscle of yeah. that. We're less likely to kind of do that push and pull of I need to be above mm-hmm. you to feel a sense of safety because yeah. I can trust mm-hmm. you enough to put that down, mm-hmm. even momentarily, mm-hmm. that we can be in this sense of precarity, this unknown together, yeah. and and neither of us will die. I think that underneath mm-hmm. that, the fear is that if we put those defenses down, yeah. if we have the completely undefended heart, mm-hmm. we will be attacked, mm-hmm. and it's uh, actually. It, yeah. We build a practice of being in each other's company with that undefended yeah. heart. And, and we learn to understand that it, it's okay. Yeah. But of course, sometimes it isn't. Yeah. <laughs> right. And it's that when the injury comes, can we then move to repair again? Sure. Can we acknowledge and take responsibility with each other? Mm-hmm. And that I think, you know, we talked about this as, you know, the, the kind of move between individual and relational yeah. work. But I think there is something in how the other can be sometimes a, a kind of fragmented mirror to mm-hmm. us 
So when we are saying, you know, this is who I am, can you love me? And they come back saying, no, mm-hmm. actually, it, it, this is not, I can't love you. Yeah. And, and so we internalize a sense of fragmentedness yeah. that we, we are broken and we leave the relationship yeah. feeling less ourselves. But when we are in front of someone who says, yeah. no, you, even in your capacity to hurt, yeah. I can see you and I'm still with you yeah. and I love you, something else becomes possible. Yeah. And I think that's a disruption in itself of, of that mm-hmm. hierarchical move. Mm-hmm. Uh, we are kind of becoming whole mirrors for each other or learning to practice that. Yeah, yeah. I think, I think you know, the compassion piece is, is, is the next kind of, I don't know, activism, you know, mm-hmm. but like, like love you know i mean sometimes i define compassion differently than love but compassion more so meaning like how do we name the suffering and how do we tend to the suffering Mm -hmm. right but not just tend to it but have this this intention to actually disrupt that suffering Mm -hmm. right you know not just for myself but for everyone and Mm -hmm. for everything right and i just think that like there is Many of us don't feel resourced enough mm. to do that for ourselves or for others. Like to continually name the suffering and continually vow to disrupt mm. that, you know, to tend to it in, in whatever way feels appropriate. You know, and what spaces are there for us to tell the truth about that? Mm. That like, I, I want you to be well, but I just can't tend to you right mm, now. Mm, mm. You know, like, I just can't take this text. Mm. I can't, I can't respond to this text. I can't yeah. pick up the phone mm-hmm. for you. I can't show up to another process of meeting mm-hmm. with you about your feelings yeah, <laughs> and, yeah. and about how I've hurt you. Like, mm-hmm. you know, it may even be that. Mm-hmm. Maybe my perceived villainy actually comes from my utter mental exhaustion right and not having what i need Mm -hmm. to Mm -hmm. be careful or full of care Mm -hmm. in a relationship Mm -hmm. like i'm not choosing that Mm -hmm. i just don't have a choice Mm -hmm. you know like how Mm -hmm. how can we even hold that Mm -hmm. for people Mm -hmm. you know when people could another way of saying it like when when we want to have that that meeting with someone to confront mm-hmm. some issues. And when the person comes back and says, you know what, I just can't do this. Yeah. Right. And that leaves us mm-hmm. with this disappointment, mm-hmm. but also the discomfort mm-hmm, mm-hmm. of something being unresolved. Mm-hmm. Because at the end of the day, I'm trying to survive off of someone's validation mm-hmm. of me. I think that's what drives forgiveness culture. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You know, it's like we need to be validated by people. So we need people to forgive us, Mm -hmm. you know, so we can go back to feeling okay. But when that doesn't happen, then Mm -hmm. it's just more suffering. Mm -hmm. Right. You know, I don't know if there's a, that's a question or an answer (laughs) to something, but I think it's just a paradox that we're constantly wrestling with. Yeah. 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 You know, particularly in communities, liberatory communities where we're trying to do this work Mm. right like we get together naturally or informally whatever however we come Mm -hmm. together we're together but we're all so extremely exhausted yeah yeah you know I i think there's also there's something about you know we coming back to that piece on the fantasy of what we long for when we come into a relationship. Mm. There's something of a perfectionism in it Mm. that kind Mm. of, is there a perfect way of doing this thing, of being together? And of course, inevitably there isn't. And in a way, I think that's also the way that capitalism shows up in us. Mm. You know, that this is a, there is a perfect way. Mm. And I think what you're inviting us to return to is the inevitability of failure but also the, what I hear in that is there's gener- generativity in that space too. Yeah. Um, because as we learn to not necessarily always tend to each other's suffering, yeah. but to bear the disappointment and the discomfort of it mm-hmm. and still exercise a practice of love for ourselves, mm-hmm. right? In that, you know, something else becomes possible. We are deepening our relationship with ourselves. Yeah. Uh, and mm-hmm. I think we also get clearer we are more able to discern the sources of where love really is in its in abundance because sometimes it is you are meeting over and over again yeah. someone who mm-hmm. is just too wounded too exhausted mm-hmm. too identified with their pain like mm-hmm. you said where it's just that pain that wall of pain mm-hmm. and as we get clearer and clearer in ourselves on that work mm-hmm. of love we start to also 
um, draw people who are, who are doing the work, I yeah. think, in ways. And, and that we start to reflect that in our lives yeah. more. Um, yeah. And that's definitely been an experience mm-hmm. for me. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, I really feel that reflected in my life. Yeah. And at the same time, I think sometimes there's a, a kind of a spiritual loneliness, um, mm-hmm. this sense of, you know, the more we are doing the work, mm-hmm. it feels less and less people are living that way mm-hmm. or, or not that interested, yeah. actually, yeah. In, in really getting into the discomforting yeah. work of yeah. asking questions of what is it to live a loving life. Yeah. Um, yeah. And then we have to confront, I guess this is it, the, the, mm. deep, the deep loneliness in that. Yeah. Um, and that becomes its own work. Yeah. And I, I often find for myself kind of, um, we talked about this, the, the dance between aloneness that feels spacious and delightful and where mm. I'm connected to the divine. Mm. Um, and then this kind of the aloneness that constricts and feels sometimes quite unbearable when I just want to get out of it yeah. um, and just have touch and intimacy. Yeah. Um, and I think, it's okay also to yeah. sometimes be in both of those spaces, but that's been very much my work recently. Yeah. Yeah. Should I share about loneliness from the book? Yeah. Oh, yeah, I love yeah, that. Yeah. It's beautiful. Yeah, yeah. maybe I'll, I'll do that. Yeah. Because um, it's not Mars. Yeah. But, you know, maybe love will have me land right on it. <laughs> yeah. <I have. laughs> there we go. <laughs> Um, if you see me handle this book, it's like I didn't write it. I'm like, where the fuck is that? <laughs> but, you know, we've talked about the spiritual loneliness, and this mm. is something that feels really, it's, it, it fills up mm. for many of us as we're choosing real liberation. And I think this is a period mm. where we're having to really get serious about this. There's no more this, like, talking shit about getting free is it's get free or not Mm -hmm. right and all the levels of freedom not you know it's just the spiritual levels as well as the relative social level Mm -hmm. like to take these risks you know because Mm -hmm. when we choose real liberation we will lose shit Mm -hmm. right and some of us are saying oh i've lost enough already Mm -hmm. but there's always more to lose Mm -hmm. (laughs) but here here's the other thing it's like the things that I'm losing, do I really need them? Mm. Or have I just begun to identify with them mm. in a way that I'm trying to create this sense of comfort? Right? Because comfort and freedom don't go together. Mm. Right? Some of y'all are trying to stay nice and cozy, <laughs> you know, and you're trying to make these decisions and it's creating even more suffering. Because you feel it's a tension. It's a mm-hmm. real intense tension. Mm. Um, Can I say what? Ask you one question. Yeah, uh-huh. into this, I'm just really curious. Sure. I think yes to letting go. Yeah. Um, where do we find the line, though? I think of yeah. cultivating an ethic that does it does kind of spread into community. Sure. W- where there is a there is more of a dispersed kind mm-hmm. of sense of responsibility. Right to show up differently rather than kind of this continual well if you're not doing the work then i'll let i'll let it go because i think sometimes what i struggle is we we feed into disposability culture um and and then no one's doing the work (laughs) you know like there's just so many more and more and more people are not doing the work um well then the other question is like how do I invite people into the work that mm. isn't just another expression of violence? Yeah. Mm. You know, how can I f- get people to do the work when they don't want to do the work? Yeah. And where's the line at? Yeah, yeah. You know, because when I talk about freedom, freedom, of course, is doing the work. Like, mm-hmm. you have to consent yeah. to freedom. Like, no one can force you yeah. to get free, mm. right? But we think we can just yell at people enough and they'll get yeah, it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, it's the whole thing. There's a lot of kind of rhetoric around holding people to account, which is a really interesting right. use of language. The idea that we can make another yes. accountable. Yes. Um, which is, I think it's interesting for me also as a, just in my work as a, as a psychologist, yeah. um, because there's almost, there's a consenting to the work of self-examination. Yeah. Someone is coming in to say, help me look at myself, help me like live differently. You yeah. know, but of course, that that like you named earlier, that consent isn't always there yeah. in relationship. 
um, I was thinking, I, I love just like the etymology of words and I was looking at accountability. Mm-hmm. Um, and if you go back to kind of, it's about computare, which is about kind of computing, but yeah. also to reckon with, right? right? Mm-hmm. And, and, you know, in this, I think, particular moment, we are really confronting a reckoning with uh, the unveiling of what's happening that's, mm-hmm. that's really been there. But we are, there are also people, many people yeah. who are continually insisting on denial. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and so I think mm-hmm. we're, we're kind of having to ask of each other, mm-hmm. can I, if I am doing this reckoning, if I'm living this reckoning, will it in my living kind of pass on to you? Mm-hmm. And we have to trust, I think. And, you know, we, we, talk, we talked a lot about this. Yeah. The work of trust is so integral to this, yeah. which is that if I trust I live this enough, yeah. it will be a mode of transmission in my own living. It will find its way into your living, you know. But it... But it doesn't always. Right, right. <laughs> <laughs> I'm trusting it. I know, like... It will, some ways. I mean, some of us have been, like, transmitting this for decades. Yeah, yeah. some folks, and they haven't gotten the fucking point yet. <laughs> you know? I mean, but that's this is where this is where I go because yeah. for me it's like I have to hold space for the possibility that people will not choose yeah. mm-hmm. freedom, you know, and then what do I do then? Yeah. You know? And yeah. it's not like I'm not saying that we go away. It means that like I have to reinvest my energy. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Right. You know? And how do I do that in a way that's held? Mm-hmm. with a lot of care, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. right, for people. So it's not like I'm getting rid of someone. It's that, like, I'm recognizing where people are. Yeah. And it's a recognition of also another's divinity sure. being kind of at its own pace at someone else's path yeah. Yeah. Um, that they might have to make 15 mistakes or kind mm-hmm. of commit particular harms. That, and that's not a disavowal of responsibility. Right, right, right. But it's it's a recognition that you are on your own path, yeah. and that, that that might still come to a place of mm-hmm. liberation, but at a different pace and yeah. in a different shape yeah. than my own. Yeah. Um, and there's a surrender in that. I think that isn't yeah. always easy. And then you have to s- be there to witness mm. that that continuous falling down, right? And you have to hold that and mourn that. Mm. You know, and and say, oh, this is what this person has to do. That's the teaching for them. They have to go through this. As my mm. mom used to say, you know, when I was a teenager, you know, I, I you know, we get, you know, I started getting real sassy when I was a teenager. You know, it's hard to do that with black women. It's <laughs> only so far that goes. Uh, <laughs> but my mom was cool though. She was just like, listen, I'm not gonna argue with you. I'm not gonna threaten you about anything. But mm-hmm. then she, she just started telling me, listen, you will learn. Yeah. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and then she just dropped it. She dropped it. She wouldn't mm-hmm. be like, you need to do this, this, and this. I'll be like, no, uh-uh. Mm-hmm. And she was like, okay, mm-hmm. you're going to learn. Mm-hmm. And I did learn. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I had, sometimes I had to learn the hard way. Mm-hmm. You know, and I'm grateful that now I choose the easy way to learn. <laughs> <laughs> but I just want to... <laughs> You know, but these are just like, these are hard things that mm. we all want to be good people. Mm. Like, we all want to be the social justice hero and like, <laughs> and all of that. We want to take on these roles. Mm. But like, there are times when we say, you know what? I've done as much as I can do. Yeah. I can't pull you to freedom. Mm-hmm. So now I just have to hold you, you know, and not just like, not this fixated holding, but I just have to hold the space and witness. Mm. You know, you make mistakes, Mm -hmm. and I have to mourn this, Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. you know, for you, Mm -hmm. you know, maybe with you, Mm -hmm. right? And it's hard for us to hold that because it feels really um, passive. Yeah. And I think too many of us are so so identified with being active, you know? Like, Mm -hmm. I mean, many of us are active, you know, activists and organizers is doing what we're going to do, but, like, holding space and witnessing is as much doing mm. as well and that, that can feel really lonely yeah and, and I think it feels really important mm. for this time because yeah. there's a really strong um, kind of messaging that we need to be looking you know witness is being as kind of looking constantly on the screen being engaged in social media with the brutalization of, of, of Palestinians and I think there's something about the witness of the heart yeah. actually 
this is where we can be looking. Yeah. We can be really attuned to the suffering of others from here. Yeah. It's not only, yeah. uh, you know, this, this, I, I guess it's just coming to this idea of, of activism and action. Yeah. Um, I think sometimes it can get muddied between a performance as well of a particular type of mm-hmm. care. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, and, and actually, if you dig at it, it's it's actually quite disconnected from the heart because mm-hmm. we've got in, we've got into a compulsion and a performance of something that's that's not rooted in, in a deep interconnectedness of our suffering, uh, and so it, this witnessing from the heart that's actually yeah. I think what you're speaking to is about stillness is sometimes about quiet mm-hmm. um, that is conducive you know the yeah. practices of prayer yeah that are energetic movements this is movement mm-hmm. you know of energy and calling in on love that is moving also through the, the unseen world because I think we get quite fixed on what we can see yeah. but so much is also happening beyond mm-hmm. that we also are being asked to trust in and I think we you know even right now the, the Palestinians are showing us how to do that yeah. with that kind of unwavering faith yeah. again and again yeah. you know they, they call out to something greater yeah. because there's something I think of the the trust in a freedom mm. of Palestine mm. that we're also being asked to practice, that it is coming, um, mm-hmm. that I think this work is deeply heart-centered and also about the unseen world. Yeah, yeah. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Right, you know, and to hold our experiences of helplessness mm. in this, I think we really struggle with that. Yeah. You know, um, and for me, it's not helpless for me to choose to pay attention. Mm-hmm. to choose to show up in awareness mm-hmm. right because awareness is what we need to get free mm-hmm. right that's the first stage of abolition is showing up mm-hmm. <laughs> to the truth right mm-hmm. and wrestling with it mm-hmm. but as you wrestle with it your heart is going to break mm-hmm. right and along with the arising of the rage and mm-hmm. the despair and the hopelessness all of that mm-hmm. and how do you just allow that Mm. You know, it, it doesn't. It's not about condoning or celebrating it. It's just saying this is happening. Yeah. This is happening. This is what I'm feeling. This is what my community is feeling. Mm-hmm. But I have to show up and remember, mm. and to hold this, and then a response to that holding means that like I am vowing to help bring about a world mm. where this doesn't happen. Mm. Right. Where this genocide, these wars. You know the brutality of systems are no longer happening. Yeah. Right. Yeah. You know? And and living that too, I think, in our most intimate lives, because yeah. I think this is the piece, isn't it, that mm. we're like, uh, mm. my commitment to yeah. this is dreaming of a free Palestine. Yeah. Yet I am complicit in domination in my in yeah. these intimate relationships, yeah. and so we we're asked again and again to come into to loving relationship. Yeah. yeah as a means of disrupting yeah. the domination that's happening in the world. Yeah. And that's the complexity of it. Yeah. Like I'm trying to get free. I'm trying to actively like name these systems, but I'm also actively participating mm. in them as well. Mm. Right. You know, that we're, we're both victims and villains mm. at the same time. But how mm-hmm. do we hold that in care? Because care is how we're going to start evolving yeah. out of the, this tension yeah, yeah. into like the the space of liberation mm-hmm. which for me is abolition mm. you know like we have to abolish these systems that put us into this bind to begin with yeah 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 right? yeah i mean I'm, I'm thinking about i think is it mariam carver who talks about mm-hmm. abolition as presence sure. um rather than absence and this thing about the invitation to be present mm-hmm. also you know what you're naming yeah. to our heartbreak mm-hmm really coming into that and holding that yeah. um but i i'm also thinking about because you were you were naming this we, we're both villains and victims mm-hmm. right and we we kind of we were talking about this queer drama <laughs> as as this villainy and this yeah. victimhood yeah. but there's something about i think drama as well that is yeah. theatrics kind of the theater in a way mm-hmm. and and we have to acknowledge that there's something entertaining sometimes oh, absolutely. about like the victim, and the victim. like yeah. we, we love a bit of drama a little bit of pettiness you know, we... like cussing people out like i love it yeah i mean i, I don't love it actually <laughs> <laughs> but like but this is it but this is it though it's like how do we hold that that you know that, that yeah. people actually do get pleasure in the drama 
You know, mm. people get pleasure in making villains and the kind of vengeance takedowns, uh, kind of or cancellation culture. Like it gives them a sense of righteous power uh-huh. over, you know. And also, I mean, it's it served us in our media for years. Like mm-hmm. we love to watch that shit, you know. Um, I, I'm thinking about. I mean, I'm just also thinking about this. Just bear with me. Just playing this out, kind of of theatre. You know, theatre. There's so much about rehearsal. Yeah. Um, and how can we kind of step into a, a sort of a dress rehearsal of different roles? Like, what does that mean to, I'm thinking, yeah. you know, about like sainthood. Like, yeah. what is it if we're practicing something a bit, a bit of a messier sainthood? Yeah. You know, what, how do we embody something yeah. different? And I think part of this is rehearsal. We need to get better at practicing and giving each other permission to get messy in the dress rehearsal you know, and to hold that with each other. I mean, that's it. Like, yeah. I, I sometimes, when I'm watching drama, yeah, like, I enjoy it because it's, it feels like it is expressing something for me. It's doing mm. emotional labor for me, mm. you know? And I feel like it's tending to me, watching other people go at it. Yeah. And then afterwards, it's like, oh, that was good. Because <laughs> these are the things I wish I could say. Mm-hmm. You know, like some of us, for instance, like some of us listen to the worst hip hop and rap possible. <laughs> like that, that kind of stuff that you just can't play out loud walking down the street. You know, you know what I'm talking about. You know, like we love it. You know, and I had a dear friend, teacher friend of mine, you know, who loved that bad hip hop. Mm. You know, that we used to just drop it, you know, like you used to be in the club and, you know, and then she goes, you know what, you know, we listen to this because this music is expressing something that we're afraid to express for ourselves, mm-hmm. you know, and I was like, God, oh, that makes a lot of sense, mm-hmm. you know, and the same with drama, Mm-mm-mm. something's happening that we don't feel like we're safe enough mm-hmm. to express for ourselves. So right. we're living vicariously, mm-hmm. you know, but then it gets to this point where it's like distracting. Mm. Like we just need to, we're we're doing it to be entertained and distracted from this right. other right. suffering. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right, you know, and it creates a kind of hierarchy again where it's just like, oh, they're messy. Mm. You know, I'm not that messy. <laughs> you know, um, but we kind of are because we are living through that with them. Yeah, yeah. You know, yeah. and choosing that. Yeah, and yeah. I think that that sense of sh- the shame mm. and denial of one's own messiness mm-hmm. means that it ends up existing yeah. in everywhere else everyone oh, yeah. else but you is the pe- is the yeah. is the location of the it. do it <laughs> <laughs> do it <laughs> no but no but really i think i think it's an important i think there are useful tools in in that framework of psychology sometimes you know um you, but, but it's real like we find ways all kinds of ways to not look yeah. here all kinds of ways everyone else becomes the problem yeah. um, and, and so I, I think these things can be really wonderfully delicious if we're sitting there watching the drama and using it as a way to go like ah how is that character in me mm. you know mm. I, like that that's more interesting to me yeah. um, but obviously that's not how it is <laughs> <laughs> but, but some you know I've been on my journey for me example with, with hip hop yeah. mm-hmm. like just uninterrogated listening of this mm-hmm. stuff when I was younger yeah. um, also because of my own kind of gender journey my, the modelling of masculinity was so heavily shaped sure. by hip hop which was mm-hmm. like oh I need to get girls mm-hmm. to be able to affirm my sense of gender you know yeah. and and, so, and it really has taken me my a lot of time mm-hmm. to, to examine that and to make different choices mm-hmm. but but it, I think what it really acknowledges is the conditionality mm-hmm. to so much of our behaviors that it's the things around us mm-hmm. the systems that are around us the way patriarchy makes itself known through music mm-hmm. through the state you know mm-hmm. that then finds its way into our bodies mm-hmm. and how can we build the skill to actually pay more attention to that to then make different choices mm-hmm. and that's not to say we get rid of all the, the music <laughs> but it's we, we then we, we're in different relationship with it mm-hmm. You know, yeah. Um, mm-hmm. I'm really mindful of time, and I want to hear sure, you what read. Time? Mm-hmm. Yeah, what's the time? So my uh, time is ten. Minutes. We've got five minutes. Okay. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And then we're, we're going to take some questions as well. Um. Okay. Let's see. Um. 
So yeah, so, you know, in, in the book, if you happen to buy the book, and I hope you do happen to buy it. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's good for you. And support a starving queer writer. <laughs> I'm not, not going to lay that on you. I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not starving. But I, I, I do need a new bag, though. Um, <laughs> just to be real about it, you know. Um, so I just want to read just a paragraph or two of, of this. Um, and this is called Spiritual Loneliness. And I talk about different kinds of aloneness and loneliness um, mm. in this section. But this is something that a lot of people have gotten a, a lot of support from. So this is Spiritual Loneliness. In the words of Dorothy Day, the great activist and co-founder of the Catholic Worker Movement, a spiritual loneliness feels like a long loneliness. This one phrase completely articulated an experience that had been with me for many years. It spoke to me of the distance I felt between myself and others as I chose a life of service. It was the loneliness I felt engaging in a lifestyle that was so radically countercultural and misunderstood. When you start working to get free, you will experience the most intense loneliness because you will, real, you will realize that most people around you will not understand what you are beginning to work toward. They, like you at one point, are self-identifying with the experience of incarceration, which is the experience of contraction. When you choose freedom, you choose spaciousness, which will make you look suspicious and make you dangerous because you remind everyone that they are complicit in their contraction into incarceration. Mm -hmm. Spiritual loneliness means spiritual loneliness means that I am living within God, which means that I am touching into the formless expression of love, taking me out of a linear timeline. I'm living in the past, present, and future all at once, but still trying to stay in relationships, get work done, have fun, eat dinner, and trying all the while not to alarm people around me as I struggle to communicate that though it seems like I am here, I am really not, and that the complete truth is that there was never a here to be at. Mm -hmm. Spiritual loneliness is the work of living through the illusion of there not being a here. So, you know, just to, you know, a little bit of contextualizing this, you know, um, for me, when I, when I am really like in this practice of spiritual loneliness, I'm realizing that it's space that's taking care of me. Mm -hmm. It's space that like I am trying to relate to. Mm -hmm. And space is something that feels uneasy for me because most of my life has been about contraction mm -hmm. and rigidity which for me drives this idea yeah. <clears throat> of carcerality, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. you know. And uh, in the book, if you read the book, um, I have these levels of understanding the carceral state. And the mental, spiritual carceral state is this experience of feeling trapped mm -hmm. within the illusion of form, mm -hmm. you know, that everything is this illusion that I am trying to practice to remember mm -hmm. its illusionary quality. But when I forget that, I am trapped. Mm. I feel trapped in my body, trapped in my thoughts, trapped in things around me, trapped mm. in relationships. And what I'm trying to get back to is the fluidity. Yeah. When you start getting fluid, mm. the loneliness starts because you realize so many people around you are not remembering that fluidity. Yeah. And that yeah. feels really distancing. Yeah, yeah, right? yeah. Yeah. I, I, I love, I, first of all, I love that bit in the book. Mm -hmm. um, but also... The reminder that when we start to enter into more mm -hmm. spacious ways of living and seeing the world, there's so much discomfort because of the unfamiliarity of it, mm -hmm. and that the move can be actually to aversion yeah. because it's so unfamiliar. Yeah. But it's so important that we stay yeah. because it only opens mm -hmm. us up to more possibility. Yeah. And I think coming back to mm -hmm. you know what we're talking about, which is villainy and victim, the casuality of these binary ways of seeing the world, yeah. that is contraction. And when we start to challenge. Mm -hmm and lean into <coughs> other ways of being, it does yeah. create uncomfortable space. Yeah. Um, and we're not practiced and it's not modeled yeah. how to be with that. So yeah. of course we start to feel a bit of aversion, 
but it's so important to stay with that yeah. because that too is is generative yeah. that discomfort mm. yeah. you know yeah yeah and and i think what i found and i, I want to name really helpful is spiritual relationships yeah. that can hold that with me you know that where i can name uh we're doing this work we're, we're kind of going into slightly different right. terrain other essentially other people that are doing the work yeah you know where we can we can stay in those places together yeah. Um, and see what comes into fruition yeah. from that discomfort, yeah. Um, yeah. and and it's a deepening of relationship. Yeah. You know, I I I've, I um, was listening to Kazu Haga talk. I don't know if you know their work, um, but they they do a lot of work around conflict, yeah. and they were talking about conflict as the spirit of the relationship asking itself to deepen. Mm-hmm. So that there's something about kind of the coming together when we are challenging and meeting each other's edges yeah. that asks us to reveal more and more of ourselves yeah. to dare to tell the mm-hmm. truth even if it risks kind of creating mm-hmm. distance mm-hmm. And, that, and therefore we go deeper together yeah. um, and I find yeah. that this is we're in that kind of terrain aren't we we're talking yeah. about this as we put causality down we yeah. enter into this spacious yeah. uh, place where relationship can really deepen yeah. and we change I mean, yeah, as you're talking about we change and yeah. Can we hold that change? Yeah. Can we let go of who we think we are? Yeah. And to start leaning into and expanding in, into what we actually are. Yeah. Right? Which I interpret as boundless. Mm. Like space, emptiness, intelligence, mm. you know, love, whatever, right? Yeah. You know, but we have to, like, be able to take that risk. Yeah. To leave what we think is comfortable then expand into this unknown. Yeah, yeah. You know? And yeah. that's the loneliness. That's the loneliness I was getting at when I was talking about God. It's like, mm. I am taking a chance to let go of what feels familiar yeah. and comfortable mm. and then expanding, mm. you know, which is a journey that for me, I'm grateful to have been held by people who who were making these choices as well. These mm. are the teachers, mm. you know. My teachers have helped me and held space for me as I've changed, mm, mm, you know. Yeah. And, you know, letting go of who we think we are mm-hmm. is, like, continual, extremely Definitely. uncomfortable and difficult mm. work. But I, I've, I've been thinking about this recently, you know, that the sonar that exists mm. in your mind or exists in Dan's mind or Nova's mind. Yeah. So these are all my friends here, by the way. <laughs> they're, 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 they're all different. They, I, I will exist as, as a different being in each of your minds. Yeah. And how both painful in ways that is and grief filled and also freeing that is Mm. that there is you know there's so much fluidity to who we are yet we get so fixed on having a certain story Mm. and and it's incredibly liberatory to actually lean into that you know that i will take different shapes in different bodies and that's Mm. also okay and it's so much less personal Mm. you know who who i am is the meeting of of me and you, yeah. and how that then takes shape, you know, that it's its own concoction that is beyond my control, you know. Yeah. Um, I'm really mindful of time and we want to take questions. I wanted to read a poem, but maybe, should we just do, yeah. should we do a really, yeah. really, really quick poem? Yeah, they don't have any questions. No, 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 I want questions. I want questions. Um, also, you named God. And we didn't even get to go into God. We didn't even get to oh, talk about God. Oh, that, pull that word through space. <laughs> um, so this... This book is very much... Um, is someone trying to come in now? Yes. I was, I was, I was so late. <laughs> um, I love you. Oh, wow. What time is this? <laughs> the right time. That's real love. <laughs> anyway, you've got the, you've come in time for the prayer reading, so... Um, so the book is very much like asking questions of God and faith and belief. Um, and really also kind of delighting in that place of belief and unbelief being kind of continually in conversation. Mm-hmm. That, that um, unbelief gives permission, actually, in a way for belief to go deeper. Um, and so this poem is kind of speaking to that and also the villainy and victimhood mm-hmm. stuff, the grey, the juicy grey. Um, This is called On the Days That I Believe. Mm. On the days that I believe, I don't see white people as the devil. Mm. I run towards the snarling dog in my belly and stroke its drooling fear. 
And at the frontier between what I think is me and not me, the sun bleeds under my ribcage. I say to the pigeon's green neck, it's all right to be loved. And when my lover needs a new recipe, I pull a page from the scripture. I don't search, is it haram to be queer? I am less center of the universe and more comma curled into a mattress. I see the prophet's cheek in a sliced moon, the oak's root felt in my throat. That lonely prayer becomes an orange commune to unpeel at the stink heel of Fajr believers. A self-dissolution. We are drunk, horny gods. <laughs> Can't cancel our holy. Do a loving kindness meditation for the waste man that snaked you. See yourself in the slither. The hiss eventually softens. Get your tongue right in my ear. The world is speaking in its own voice. I believe in everything I haven't been told. Thank you. Thank you everyone for being with us and we'd love, to, we'd love to just open it up and hear from you and have some questions, if you have questions. Um, so I'd like to know about how these ideas of good and bad impact your writing process, mm -hmm. like the actual yeah, the action of writing, um, because I feel like, you know, when you're writing something for others to read, the good and bad comes into play, and there's a lot of pressure, expectations for it to be, or it can be. So I'm just curious to know how you get past those things or mm. cope with them. You mean like when you're writing and you're saying, oh, this isn't good enough for people to read? That mm. self, that judgment, that mm, criticism. Mm, mm, oh. mm. Mm. So how it's received. Yeah. Mm. I mean, I feel like I feel like Rod's in a more liberated place, a more liberated <laughs> being than I am with this stuff. <laughs> I'm still, I'm still, I'm still very much um, working with, uh, at times being kind of feeling incarcerated by yeah. that gaze of the other, or yeah. the other being the white gaze, yeah. um, my mother's gaze, you know, my ex lover's mm. gaze, you know, all of these things that's that kind of have shaped my ideas of what is good. Mm. And, and it, it makes itself known in the writing in quite surprising ways, actually. Yeah. Like, their eyes will be on it. <laughs> yeah. and, and I'll be like, oh, is that really, mum, you're here? Mm -hmm. Well, I'm writing the sex poem. Okay, interesting. <laughs> you know, and it, so it's, and, and I think what, what I've come to be in relationship, me personally, with is, it's not that they, are, they leave. It's how can I do a more compassionate yeah. witnessing of their presence, but stay close to myself. So, so they might be in company, but how can I kind of be in that company in a soft way, yeah. but I stay in, in integrity, yeah. where I can come back again and again to get clearer of what is my own, what is my own seeing? Mm -hmm. you know, and, and I want to acknowledge and name that that seeing isn't always clear, because it has been so muddied in my living and through my conditioning. Yeah. And so I'm very much in an emergent process of getting clearer and clearer. And it feels really liberatory right now where I am because it feels clearer than it's ever been. Yeah. But it still comes in and it still hurts. And I still do the, oh, like, what do the poets think? Um, do the poets think that this is poetry? Mm. You know, like <laughs> the, the literary industry, you know, will it get, will it get acknowledged by the prize? Right. All of these mm. things. I have to yeah. catch it. I really have to catch it. Yeah. And so, oh, so no, that's, that's there. Yeah. And, and I come back to myself. Yeah. And it's that kind of continual practice of, of return, the U-turn to come underneath, is it's got nothing very, really very little to do with the prizes. Yeah. Because actually, even if I got them, I still feel deficient and inadequate. Yeah. It's so deep, yeah. that wound. But it, so it's more, can I notice the wounding underneath and repeatedly tend to it? and trust in my own divinity, yeah. that inherent kind of goodness beyond 
anyone else's dictation of it. Yeah. You know. Mm-hmm. I don't know if you want to say anything as well. No, that was beautiful. Oh, yeah. okay. <laughs> <laughs> Gorgeous. Yeah. 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 <laughs> <laughs> I have a question. Um, I was ruminating a lot on what you said about like loving people without liking them and like you I'm really into like etymology and words but to me like to like someone sorry to love someone liking them is like a quintessential kind of condition to that Mm. um so I feel like I can acknowledge people and hate them and I can acknowledge people and I can love them and like them so is there a difference between loving someone without liking them and acknowledging them or is it just like a semantic thing that I'm not being like I'm not processing basically well, you know, the, the love piece, so the, the liking, like when we like and love someone, that's, that's hopefully our lovers or, you know, our partners, mm-hmm. our BFFs. I mean, that's, that's when like and love come together. But there were, are people that will never like. And I spent, and I felt like to be a good person, I had to like everyone, mm-hmm. right? And I had to let that go because there was a carceral logic that wasn't helping me get free, mm-hmm. you know, and helping me to get truthful, Mm. about how to show up in relationships, you know, and not struggle so much, you mm. know. So when we're really, this is why I'm saying when we really are investing in love, I'm also saying that I'm going to still see you, mm. you know, but I'm going to be clear about the ways in which I may or may not disrupt your access to the resources you need mm. to be well. That's cleared up a lot of stuff for me over the years, you know. And sometimes the choices that, like, I, I can't even, I can't be near you even, but I still want you to yeah. get what you need, mm-hmm. you know, and telling the truth that, like, I'm not the person who's going to help you, mm-hmm. except if what you need is for me not to hurt you, <laughs> put my mm-hmm. hands on you, then definitely I can do that in my practice, mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> you know? I, I think I would also say, though, because I do sometimes think we're quite quick to say, I like you and I don't. Mm-hmm. Mm. And and then and then there's a kind of g- a giving up quite quickly on yeah. the other. And I was having I had an experience on retreat mm-hmm. recently. Actually, a so few of us were on that retreat together here. Yeah. Um, and on retreat, there's a lot of people you don't know, right? Yeah. And you, it was quite interesting actually how quick you have aversion to people that you just there's no reason, <laughs> there's no reason they want to chat to you. And there's just some part of you that's just like. Becky, don't talk to me, please. I just, I, just don't want, I just don't want that. You know, and there's no, there's no rational explanation, right? And it was so interesting because I had this experience and this person had asked me to have lunch with them. And I noticed this kind of, ah, uh, I don't really want to, but I stayed with it. And in the conversation, one of the things they'd said to me was about, was a teaching on dislike. And what they said was, um, when dislike comes up, the question to follow ought to be, ah, I dislike you, what more is there to know about you? Wow. You know, and I was like, wow. <laughs> <laughs> no, really, like, that was actually, but I didn't say that, but I, I was so kind of in awe in that mirror because I was like, there is an invitation here mm-hmm. to discover more because the assumption is so quick and absolutely unjustified, really. Mm-hmm. It's, you know, it's not about you or, it, or even what I know in me, mm-hmm. but how can I stay a little longer mm-hmm. to open myself mm-hmm. up to the possibility mm-hmm. of getting to know greater things that will kind of create more heart connectedness? Mm-hmm. And that is exactly what happened. Because when he started dropping the wisdom bars, I was like, oh my God, I need to take notes, <laughs> you know? And that's, that's kind of, that's, uh, so I do think there's something I hear, I, like absolutely there will mm-hmm. be people that we kind mm-hmm. of make attempts to like yeah. again and again, yeah. and it just is, it just doesn't feel possible. Yeah. But I, I think that m- most often we make very few attempts. Mm. <laughs> you know, we, we make very few attempts to stay long enough to see what else might emerge in the unknown place. Mm. You know, um, yeah. yeah. And you have to trust yourself too. Sometimes there's a real intuition that says, you know what, I'm not trying to get closer. Yes. As well. Yeah, yeah, and I yeah. think for a lot of us. Yeah we've been taught to distrust that intuition. Mm. Mm. You know, I think sometimes we get into spaces where Mm. we're being convinced to bypass our deeper intuitions, and I think that puts us into danger. Yeah. You know, Um, and just to be, you know, it's not, you just have to get clear about this, Mm -hmm. you know. Um, 
But like, I just don't, it's not a big deal for me not to like people. It mm-hmm. really isn't. Like, it's not tied to my goodness. Yeah. You know, it's just like, but it's so much more important. Like, you know, I think, I think we can spend a lot of time on liking because we make it real personal and about validation instead of like doing the real revolutionary work of love. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Revolution happens through love mm-hmm. because love helps us to tell the truth mm-hmm. and to make hard choices, you know? Um, and that's why I always go to love mm-hmm. over life, you know? Um, but if there's time and space and if the signs are clear, yeah, okay, maybe mm-hmm. let's get closer, you know? But if we're talking about getting free right now, you know, let's talk about love. Mm-hmm. You know? That's a beautiful teaching. I'm gonna take that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna incorporate that. Um, so I feel like we have this conversation a lot about mm-hmm. disposability culture, mm-hmm. um, and I also find it really interesting when you were saying about two people in conflict and um, staying in that conflict and trying to see how, essentially, how much you can learn from mm-hmm. the conflict. Mm-hmm. And I'm wondering, like, at what point does the conflict become toxic? And actually, the safeguarding is to remove yourself from the situation. And sometimes mm-hmm. I think, yeah. as queer people, we can be like service type of people, mm-hmm. um, just because mm-hmm. those are the roles we have to play. Mm-hmm. So, at what point are you trying to service someone, mm-hmm. like past the reality of like their need for service or like what you can actually give? Yeah. Um, yeah. And at what point are you not helping them by being mm-hmm. there? Because I think that's a big thing as well. Like sometimes taking space from people is actually like a big learning lesson for them. Yeah. What do you think? About yeah yeah it's a beautiful question um and i also just want to acknowledge how like blessed i feel to be in a space to be with people i love rod but also friends that i've been living and reckoning with these prob- like with these difficulties with in community and to me is one of those people and so i'm really grateful that we're, li- we're here and we're having these conversations um and, and i think i i found so much in this book i really want to just like uplift this book conflict is not abuse mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. um I, I really 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 strongly recommend it um but she talks about um kind of our our very limited capacity to bear conflict and how quickly um it, it can kind of spill into overstatements of harm um and and how it moves into these dynamics of kind of leaning into false allegations of abuse uh, where domination becomes kind of the device right because we can't stay in that place long enough to work it out and i think what you're asking is also how can we be more discerning of when we've exhausted our resources enough to really reckon that this person is not able to do the work um and and that is its own skill but i i I think what i struggle with sometimes is I don't think that we have built a, a kind of a practice to also stay mm-hmm. to, to do, you know, because we're so quick because of our past histories of hurt, yeah. any kind of um, symbol of threat kind of sends us like in a time machine back to our past mm-hmm. and the person in front of us becomes a symbol of all of those other people who have hurt us mm-hmm. and it just becomes impossible to bear. So I have deep compassion for it. And I think we do need to deepen our muscle to stay a bit to stay a bit longer, but we both need to be willing to do that work. Mm-hmm. And this is the key thing, I think, which is that so often, the, you know, mm-hmm. not both people are willing to do that work because it requires a degree of self-examination. Mm-hmm. And most people can't bear to look at the, de- the de-idealized yeah. self. Yeah. You know, we have a kind of a, a, a pedestaled self. Yeah. Nova, do you want to come in here? Because I yeah. feel like, yeah, go on. There is an element of racialization that's at play yeah. discerning when you stay, lean in, or when you yield. Because yeah. there is something very specific about those of us who are black bodies mm-hmm. where we've been taught to override our suffering. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I think there's a other layer when the, the interpersonal experience that we're having where harm has happened or has been happening is from somebody who is in a white body yeah because there is the consent that is needed but there's also such a discrepancy between i'm trying to hold this by being truthful about the experience and not um 
and staying away from hierarchy, mm -hmm. but there is a very there is a different experience that I'm going to having in relationship with somebody who is white, mm -hmm. and not looking at how white supremacy is present in our mm -hmm. relationship, mm -hmm. versus me doing that with a different racialized body, and mm -hmm. so there is discernment that we have to have, and I think that discernment is different depending on the body that you're interacting yeah. with. Yeah. So yeah. just holding that yeah. in mind and offering that as yeah. well. Yeah. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. And also, I think you know. Yeah. Again, it's like it's my own heartbreak coming up. Yeah. It's my own heartbreak, and also the ways in which no, it's, you know, it's, and there's yeah, no, it's it's just I think also I have to acknowledge that this has been my work, the yeah. kind of staying longer than I ought to yeah. have. Mm -hmm. um, and particularly, and particularly mm -hmm. you know, in relationship with, with white mm -hmm. bodies, um, this kind of uh, longing for a different possibility. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and, and actually that recognition that, no, this is not possible here. And this is your work beyond, beyond yeah. me and what I can give. Yeah. But the deep grief also yeah. that comes with that, yeah. um, and we and the loss because of course we long for lo loving ways to be in relationship. Yeah. We don't want to lose the other, mm -hmm. um, yeah. and and so there's something in that that's been I think difficult for me yeah. um, to work out that line of discernment. Yeah. yeah, so I have to own that. Yeah. I think sometimes too we when we talk about this idea of being good. Mm -hmm. And this probably already have, has come up, but like this is language that I'm thinking about now is that like we've also been taught to to try to take on all this other work yeah. that is an hours to take up, and mm -hmm. particularly caretaking. Mm -hmm. You know, we're doing all this caretaking, and then mm -hmm. I had to, for me, had to get to a place where I'm like, I have to let this go because I'm not surviving. Mm -hmm. You know, having to like take on all this suffering mm -hmm. in order to survive. Mm -hmm. You know, and then once you do that, then of course you open yourself up to the consequences, mm -hmm. you know, of not surviving, mm -hmm. you know, because you will get blamed, <laughs> yeah. you know, yeah. um, and that's, that's another edge of practice that we have to learn how to train to meet is that like, I even have to hold the ways in which people will blame me for harm when I'm choosing not to caretake everyone. Yeah. yeah. This is a real thing as well. Yeah. You know, and I, I also, I think there's something yeah. as well, I want to name this word, and I'd love to hear people who are mm -hmm. a bit, have more public profiles and over, yeah. Um, yeah. that the more uh, you are in a position mm -hmm. of public vulnerability, right. there is also more room for projection. Uh -huh. um, there's also more, yeah. I, I think if you are really genuine, like you said, kind of trying to commit to the work, you, yeah. you become a reflection for the parts where people aren't willing to do that. Yeah. And so you have to hold the ways that those things come onto you. And that can be really difficult and exhausting. Yeah. And so I'd love to hear your experiences mm -hmm. of, of holding that and, and being in relationship with that mm -hmm. process. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, this is what I went through. No, last question, okay. No, 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 it's cool, I, we're oh, running no, over time. We have to go. <laughs> no, I just want to say quickly, you know, that's, this, that was the process of writing this book, yeah. where it's just like, I'm just gonna like open myself up and just like, just put myself bleed all over the pages because mm -hmm. I was like, I can't get free until I tell the truth mm -hmm. about me. Mm -hmm. And then once you do that, like this is yours now. Mm -hmm. Like whatever you come back to me with, like that's your experience now. Mm -hmm. You know, like I have, I've, I've done my emotional labor for myself. Mm -hmm. Right, and so I can just I can sit through and listen to people talk about, you know, all these really personal things about my life. Mm -hmm. It has nothing to do with me, mm -hmm. you know. Like I went through the process of giving you this. Mm -hmm. Now, now it's yours. I consent to it. You can talk about it whatever way you want. <laughs> you know, you yeah, can talk yeah. shit. You know, you can like Destiny Child say you can get on the radio, you can get mm -hmm. in the magazine. <laughs> you know, um, <laughs> I'm a survivor. You know. <laughs> I'm not going to give up. <laughs> but yeah, that's it. You know, you have to let it go. You know, once you write your story, you let it go. Mm. And it becomes other people's material. Mm. You know? And you have to trust your story to be durable mm. and hold out. Mm, mm, mm. You know? Do you want to sing us out with Survivor? <laughs> <laughs> that's not the album I'm working with right now. <laughs> 
sorry that we went, we ran over. Have we, have we, got, have we got time? We're still going to like hang around for a little bit or do we all like need to go out immediately? Um, we have like 15 minutes. So you need to buy it. Yeah. 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 Okay. Okay, cool. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Much. May this be a benefit to everyone. Yes. May everyone get free from our work tonight. Yeah. And may you show up as liberators for mm. everyone in your life. And may we all get free. Yeah. So let's keep working. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Yeah. Bye, folks. <laughs>